Hi, welcome back. I'm Michael Borg for BetterMental.org. In this, the second installment of our Mindset series, we will continue to offer emerging evidence of how our genes and their behaviors are programmed by their external environment and not entirely by an inflexible inner genetic code ordained from the moment of conception as previously thought. This idea was first suggested by Charles Darwin in his infamous book On the Origin of Species, published in 1859. He further postulated the adaptation of species into more effective forms of life was caused primarily by fortunate accidents in which a new character trait would emerge purely by chance, and if the trait was advantageous to the species, it would become commonplace throughout the species, and those not born with it would quickly die out. It's been implied that Darwin's theory of accidental evolution became the mainstream simply because it was easier to believe and left the responsibility of our shortcomings to fate and or divine providence and not to our own efforts or lack thereof, as Lamarck's ideas have suggested. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who published Theory of Inheritance of Acquired Characteristics in 1801, a full eight years before the birth of Charles Darwin, believed that organisms adapted to their surrounding environments dependent on their needs and desires, passing those changes down to their offspring. He also believed that inherited traits were not necessarily predominant in the species and might not be passed down if the environment suggested their use was not needed. A good example of this is the case of snakes whose embryos show the signs of rudimentary legs for a brief period of time before losing them again prior to birth. Another of Lamarck's examples was that of giraffes, who need to stretch their necks to attain higher and higher branches for food, and as a result, their offspring were born with increasingly long necks. Unfortunately, due to the lack of appropriately precise investigative technology in the 19th century, there was no way to prove or disprove either of these theories. Regardless, Lamarck's theories were ridiculed and cast into relative obscurity for generations, only to re-emerge recently due to the supporting data being discovered. It's very easy to fall back on the simple logic of Newtonian law. The idea that everything can be reduced to cause and effect according to mathematical law is almost irresistible in that it effectively takes away any responsibility from the observer for his circumstances and or his effect on what is being observed. The idea that we are all victims of our natures and therefore have no recourse to change them is simplistic and elegant to be sure, but today, even as much as there may be those who don't want to hear it, there is more and more rising evidence to the contrary. An ex excellent example of this is mentioned in the intriguing book The Bond by Lynn McTaggart, who relates an experiment by John Cairns a geneticist from Harvard. In this decisive experiment, Carnes places several instances of bacteria that were unable to pr pr process lactose, the sugar found in milk, into petri dishes and fed them lactose as a singular source of food. According to Darwinian thinking, the death of these bacteria should have been assured, but given that their survival depended on processing the lactose, a large amount of the bacteria rapidly adapted to finding nutrition in what was previously inedible and continued to thrive, passing on this new characteristic to its offspring. We know now that less than 2% of our DNA strand produces the proteins that build the various parts of our bodies and cause certain characteristics in individuals. The rest, previously thought to be junk DNA, has been discovered to be switches turning on or off the, the protein producing strands of DNA and even beyond that are the Hox genes that command the position of the switches. Depending on the timing and the order with which these genes throw the switches, the growth of certain characteristics is affected. So as we continue to prove the validity of epigenetics, the new science exploring how our genes are directly affected by their environment, we will eventually have to admit our own role in what happens to us, even on a genetic level. We will be forced to realize that we are not only what we eat, but what we think, what we feel, a 
akin to whom we spend time with, and the result of every decision we make throughout our lives. Additionally, we are responsible for the characteristics of our children, not only after they're born, but even before conception. The truth is, there is a definite relationship between our thoughts and the outside world, and vice versa. Using the analogy of language, we are fundamentally restricted to the words we use and the intent those words internally relate to us. Obviously, words of another language say nothing to us until a meeting is connected. In that sense, a violent language allows only for the expression of violent things, and as much as we might want to relate ideas of compassion and tenderness, we find it very difficult to do so if we don't have the words to use that will connect our thoughts to the outside world. Therefore, we fall back on the wor words and expressions we're familiar with, which in turn will influence our thoughts and eventually the inner opinions of our existence. This creates the environment every one of our cells finds itself in and must gather all its information from. As painful as this responsibility may seem to our present acceptance of preordained construction, the shift to this ideology will ultimately bring with it a world of creators who accept their roles in the overall evolution of the species, or at least its survival. Gone will be the devil made me do it attitude, and in its place will emerge the idea that changing one's character for the better will not only be accepted as necessary for the greater good, but also as procedurally understood as changing one's dirty socks. So with this understanding, the next step is to restrict our thoughts to those that are consistent with growth, and avoid those that will create a detrimental opinion of our surroundings, regardless of how we feel about our circumstances right now. Remember, your mind doesn't distinguish between reality and what you tell it is real. Given enough repetition, your thoughts will change the environment your cells receive their information and attitude from, and thus they will begin to act accordingly. In an, up, in an upcoming video, we will explore effective ways to change your view of the world, regardless of your present circumstances. Of course, as always, it will take your concentrated effort, but will become second nature in time. The immediate benefits to your state of animation and general disposition will be obvious and gratifying. Until then, understand that you are just as much part of the universe as anything or anyone else and have the right, same right, to be happy and productive. Your life up to now is not nearly as important as what you do to change it for tomorrow. You will be more if you choose to be. That is the natural law of life. But the thing is, you're going to have to believe it for it to work. Bye for now.